and the, the evidence of damage to the skin by environmental pollutants and the precise molecular mechanisms of this damage I described in an article in Plastic and Aesthetic Research in October of 2020. And I discussed in detail the most common pollutants. Sunscreen is simply not enough to protect our skin. First of all, it's truly impossible to apply enough sunscreen to, to attain the SPF on the labeled sunscreen. Also, we don't, we, we always have missed spots of not application and sunscreen must be applied every 90 minutes. And even when applied properly, broad spectrum sunscreens decrease free radicals by only 55%. In urban environments, we have the additional onslaught of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons from traffic and fuels and the levels of these pollutants are below the level of toxic or tumorigenic levels themselves, but these, these become sensitized by solar UVA to become toxic and tumorigenic. This shows an experiment in which mice were exposed to benzalpyrene alone or UVA alone at, at amounts equal to those in New York City in the summer. There was no damage to the skin. However, when exposed simultaneously, there are a large number of skin cancers incited. Furthermore, there, with simultaneous exposure, there, there is an increase in DNA oxidative damage by a factor of 17 when damaged by UVA plus, U, plus pollutant is compared with just the pollutant alone. There's an increase in skin reactive oxygen species by a factor of six, and there's an increase in skin carcinogenic DNA addicts by a factor of two. Outdoor, outdoor particular nanoparticles also increase skin aging. A German study demonstrated that, that individuals who live near highways have 22% more facial antigenes and far more facial wrinkles. In China, 70% of the cooking and heating is with solid fuels inside. This leads to up to 74% dorsal hand fine wrinkles and up to 8% face, increased facial wrinkles. The biggest pollutant indoors in America is still cigarette smoke. And this definitely leads to increased wrinkles in smokers more in women than in men and increase of all kinds of skin cancer particularly lip and oral cancer, which increased by factors of 15 and 78, respectively. Here you can see that this 52-year-old smoker has far more periorbital ridities than her 57-year-old neighbor and cousin and non-smoker. This shows 29-year-old twins, and you can clearly see that the sister who smokes has far more damaged skin than her sibling. That's a non-smoker. That's the bad news. But the good news is that antioxidants help. I believe that everyone should take oral antioxidants because we just can't get optimal amounts from our diet alone. To get 1,000 to 3,000 uh, milligrams of vitamin C, we would have to eat 100 oranges per day. To get 400 international units of vitamin E, we would have to take 44 tablespoons of sunflower oil, which is 5,275 calories per day. And to get 100 micrograms per day of selenium, we would have to eat mounds of tabbouleh and lots and lots of saltwater fish. But even with optimal levels of oral dietary supplements, we cannot possibly increase the cutaneous levels of antioxidants as well as we can with topical treatment. Vitamin, with vit topical vitamin C, we can increase the cutaneous level by a factor of 27 to 40 over that with, than with oral, with oral, anti, oral vitamin C. Vitamin E, we can increase to a level 
to 11 times the, the concentration and selenomethionine, with selenomethionine, we can increase the cutaneous level of selenium by a factor of eight over oral intake. The efficacy of topical antioxidants depends on the precise formulation. To assure absorption and activity, we first of all must have the correct molecular isomer. There are 32 isomers of vitamin E, but only D-alpha-tocopherol truly helps the skin. We, the, the antioxidants must be non-esterified to be active, and they must have a high enough concentration to be effective. Vitamin C must be provided as ascorbic acid at optimal concentrations of 15 to 20%, and the formulation must be at an acid pH. Selenium is only absorbed in the form of selenomethionine, and this must be at least a concentration of 0.05%. This just shows that esters of vitamin C are not even absorbed. And if they were, as I said, they wouldn't have been active. These formulations with esters are used in almost all commercial preparations because they are stable and have a long shelf life. Ascorbic acid is very difficult to stabilize, but when applied, it obviously gives good cutaneous levels. And when applied uh, after three days daily, we get a kind of saturation in the skin. And if we stop applying it, there, there are still optimal doses in the skin that are protective for even five days after application. There is a reservoir of vitamin C in the skin. This is certainly uh, safer than just needing to apply a sunscreen every 90 minutes, but we still need sunscreen for, the, for additional protection. We have proven by many, many experiments that indeed topical antioxidants prevent UV damage to the skin. Top, they approve, uh, stop the acute damage of erythema to sunburn as, me as measured by an increase in the mineral erythema dose. There, are, it, there is a marked decrease in the blistering sunburns that occur, and there is a decrease in tanning, and tanning is uh, a measure of free radical damage. There is also protection from chronic damage of UV, particularly skin cancer and wrinkles. Histologically, when we look at skin after sun exposure, we see very, very many uh, dying cells that are called sunburn cells. When, apply, when we apply topical vitamin E alone or topical vitamin C alone, indeed there is protection against the, the sunburn cells. But when a formulation is made with both together, there is incredible synergy. So synergy, so there is far more protection. And in all of these slides, I'm talking about the formulations I mentioned before. So there is also very excellent protection against DNA damage as shown here by the, the, the very marked reduction in thymine dimers incited by UV exposure. The combination of UV, of, of vitamin E and C gives synergistic protection against skin cancer. Here you see we expose mice to UV until the first cancer appears, and then we stop the, the UV. But then in, in, in uh, the placebo mice with no supplements, the, uh, get many, many skin cancers. However, the three formulations of vitamin C and E together are almost 100% protective against UV-induced skin cancer. Selenium is a trace mineral that is an absolutely essential cofactor for 25 selenoproteins, 12 of which are antioxidant enzymes. As I said before, only selenium, selenium can only be absorbed through the skin in uh, selenomethionine. Other forms of selenium are not absorbed. This shows the, the incidence of death due to breast cancer 
as a function of the concentration of selenium in the water supply and therefore the vegetables grown in regions of the world. We can see that where there is more selenium in the water, there is less mortality due to breast cancer. Yeah. And similar, uh, similar graphs are, are the same for incidence and mortality of many other kinds of cancer. The European countries and Scandinavian countries have these levels of selenium in the water. In selenium deplete North Carolina, we found that patients with the lowest in the lowest decile of plasma concentration of selenium were 4.4 times more likely to have a basilar squamous cell carcinoma than patients in the highest decile. And we then did a prospective 10-year study with 1,300 patients supplementing with 200 micrograms per day of oral selenomethionine. And we found to our surprise that cancer mortality and overall cancer incidence decreased to a relative risk of 50 and 63% respectively. Skin cancers did decrease, but really only substantially after two years of supplementation. In, in other experiments, we again demonstrated that l selenomethionine does decrease UV-induced tumors. The fuchsia line shows that we supplemented with, with selenium while the UV light was on and after cancer started forming and no more UV was, was ex exposure existed. And we can see that was very protective against the number of skin cancers seen with, the, with no supplementation. Very luckily, when selenium supplementation is started, when, we get, when the first cancers were noted, there was almost equal protection. And this is fantastic because individuals never really take care of their, house, their health until they have a problem. Supplementation with selenium just during the UV was protective, but not at all as protective as taking selenium throughout the experiment. Here we see that we demonstrated the topical selenomethionine and topical vitamin E clearly decreased periorbital rigidities uh, to the, by, as measured and quantitated in depth and length from 60 to 74% correction in only four months of application. And Sternberg et al. Uh, made sil flow imprints of smoker skin with deep, deep wrinkles and found that after application of topical antioxidants, they decreased wrinkle depth and volume substantially. We looked at, we ex looked at many, many mice histologically and found that of course after UV, there was a lot of damage. We graded the parameters of UV histologic parameters as to the degree of hyperkeratosis, epidermal hyperplasia, damaged collagen, and solar elastosis. We found that if not exposed to UV, there is some reversal of the photo damage. Retinoic acid, tretinoin, is the gold standard of anti-aging, and indeed, all gradation of these parameters showed that there was substantial reversal of photo aging. Selen topical selenomethionine and topical vitamin E alone were even better perhaps than tretinoin in reversing photo aging. We also did electron microscopy to show that there was substantial restoration of dermal collagen and elastic tissue. So I hope that I've showed you that indeed topical antioxidants prevent, protect against environmental free radical damage and actually reverse the premature aging from previous exposure. Topical antioxidants provide an ever present reservoir of protection in our skin by application just once per day. I think we should all apply topical antioxidants even if our lifestyle is more protective than this women. And I must say that this research is, was 
this represents over 15 years of research with many, many collaborations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thanks for Dr. Buck's sharing. Uh, let's enter the discussion session. May I have a question? May I? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. First of all, thank you. It's a great presentation. At what stage do you think that the antioxidant intake uh, should uh, start? Well, I think it should start as soon as possible. And I even advise my teenage patients. We advise, we advise using sunscreen on infants less than one year old. So this gives equal protection and it's, it's natural protection. Our body uses antioxidants to, to quench free radical damage. So in fact, uh, we should start as soon as possible because it, it, it prevents the initial damage, which is being ahead of the game in, in, in protection and not aging. And in, in the article in the PAR journal, uh, the, the first illustration is a woods light picture of a very lovely young woman that has, has perfect skin apparently. But when we look with the woods light, we see that, that, that she's riddled with lentigines and these, these won't, show clinically for 20 or 30 years. And the skin cancers we get as adults are all from, are almost always from the, the extreme sun we experienced as teens and, and in our twenties, because that, those are the times we're more outside than usually as adults. So, so the, the sun damage is, is, uh, is, is histologically in our skin, but we fortunately, we don't see it clinically for decades and we don't get skin cancers until later in life, but we should start very early. With we something. hear uh, in this hospital see a lot of patients with skin cancer. Uh, first of all, of course, because if we are in the Mediterranean area, uh, there's a lot of sun, of course, but do you think that after um, skin cancer removal, um, it's a good idea so to start with the vitamin C, vitamin E, or there is a specific protocol that you can suggest me uh, to give to the patient after skin cancer removal to avoid a relapse or to avoid another skin cancer. Well, well, absolutely. Well, first of all, every time I take off a skin cancer, this is a different subject. I treat with Aldera and Miquimod 5%. And I have patients apply a Miquimod uh, three days a week because amiquimod revs up our immune system to fight precancers. And it fights, and it was first developed in the early 90s to treat warts. And then in the early 2000s, uh, we found that amiquimod uh, treated precancers, actinic keratosis. But it, and later we found that in very old people, we can even treat cancers with amiquimod. Uh, not, not as effectively as with surgery. But the point is that amiquimod identifies cancers before we even see actinic keratosis. So just applying it three days a week, because where, where there was a skin cancer, there is equal sun damage in the neighboring skin, number one. And, off, and when a patient has a skin cancer, they are far more likely to get a second and third skin cancer within one to two years of that cancer because the exposure was similar on other areas nearby. So, so first of all, I, I think that that's just always in my protocol for after I, I surgically remove skin cancers. And, and of course, I think that you don't have to wait until you get a skin cancer, as I showed with my, my supplemented mice. The sooner we start with topical antioxidants, the sooner, number one, we prevent skin cancers, but also in four to six months, everyone sees an improvement in, in, in the photo age skin in the fine crepey wrinkles um, on the face and hands. So people will use this. If, if you can convince them to use it for, for four months, they will see the, the correction and be enthusiastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay, and Dr. Uh, Rayleigh, do you have a 
Any questions? Please, uh, thank you, Dr. Burke. That was really interesting. I don't know about the US, but in the UK and in Europe, SPF is a very strong message. I know it has some limitations and some controversies, but it's a very strong message about how we protect against ultraviolet radiation. I feel that message is not so strong for pollutants. So people have talked about pollution protection factor, PPF, and it's not really ever taken. Is there a way we can start promoting protection against pollutants to, as effectively as we have with sunscreen and get people using those protections for the different environmental challenges because we've been successful i believe um, in the case of uv but not so successful for pollutants that's 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 a really good point because uh ab absolutely people should be uh, uh, especially smokers i mean i just think to show i have a series of twins that the twin that smoked looks far worse than than her his or her sister and people will will keep smoking. The, the hypothetical lung cancer is, is is something that won't happen to me. But but everyone uh, today truly fears getting wrinkles. And and when they realize that their skin is going to look terrible if they're in the sun, and if it's going to look terrible if they smoke, um, that then I think that they truly will. Uh, use this protection. It's, it's very, certainly cities are far less polluted than they used to be uh, in, the, in the 60s and 50s. Uh, so, so we've come a long way in decreasing pollution in our cities, but indoor pollution, especially in closed buildings, uh, cigarette smoke uh, is, is ever present. So not only does, does the smoker experience the damage, but there is secondary side stream so smoke. And a Yale study just came out early, came out last year, showing that there is tertiary smoke still. And in fact, uh, so they studied movie theater where there is no, has no smoking has been allowed for over seven years, but they found concentrations of pollutants because People come in from the street and there are pollutants on their clothes. There, there are all of these free radicals on their clothes that get into the air. So, so there's also tertiary damage from cigarette smoking. I think, I think we've come a long way, but we're not, we, we haven't achieved what we would like to achieve, obviously. And, and it's interesting because in, in cities, there is uh, reported in the newspaper every day the pollen level, for instance, in the spring and summer for, for asthmatic patients or eczema patients. But, but there's, and, and sometimes in some cities there is a pollution level reported, which is a very good point.